at LeWeb in uh, December, Loic asked me to run a panel discussion on drones. So I'm getting around to a lot of different companies. This one has an interesting uh, way to recharge the batteries and turn a, a drone into a data collection uh, platform. And we're going to hear more about it with Skycatch right now. I'm Chris Sands, uh, founder of Skycatch. And uh, why are you building a drone company? Well, um, a, few, a year ago, actually, I came across a construction, uh, construction site and I was doing a lot of piloting and collecting data for different people just to try to figure out if there's a business around d uh, drones when it comes to data. And uh, I realized that the process of uh, collecting data, swapping batteries, changing the SD card, uploading data to the cloud, took about an hour and a half to two hours. I wanted to remove that, and that's basically our business, making it easy to collect data. So you built a, a device that a drone can fly into. Can we actually see the video of maybe of uh, it flying into uh, this device? Right, so what you'll see is one of our drones, this is our Eldorado lab, taken off, going to a waypoint, and collecting some data and coming back and landing completely autonomously using our radio technology. Now you'll see someone else standing there. He's holding a remote control, but he's only there for safety. He's not really flying this at all. And, uh, and so your drone can f is, is using probably what, a, a GoPro camera or something? Right, so we use different types of sensors, um, a flare camera, multi-spectrum cameras, uh, but we also use the GoPro camera. We actually retrofit it with our own board so that we can actually do the shutter, taking photos um, programmatically. So we just saw it land. It did that aut autonomously. It can Com land and, and get, now it's getting its battery changed? Yeah, so you can basically put it in the middle of nowhere and it'll aut autonomously land, automatically char uh, charge, and then it'll swap the batteries for you. So you don't actually have to be there. That means that you can have these ground stations spread out through thousands of acres without the need of human interaction. So let, let's talk about why this new uh, platform needs to exist. What, what kinds of things are people trying to do with this kind of imagery well, where they have a repetition? You know? Yeah, well, we discovered like early days when I was trying to figure out if there's a real business behind it. What I discovered is that a lot of these projects that are like large enterprise projects like construction, it's very visual. At any given point, there's like at least 50 to 100 people thinking about trying to make a decision. And it's usually just visual. Are these guys working on the crane? Are the panels finished? Or are the stockpiles ready for the people to go get them? Um, so a lot of it is these are questions that can be, can be answered right away just by having visual aids. Um, also provides a really good real-time um, flexibility when it comes to security, when it comes to management of all of your resources. So what we've done is not only collect data for you to look at it on an ongoing basis, but you can, the companies are doing is retroactively going back in time and running their own algorithms on the data to see how quickly that were they able to build a certain section of something or how quickly were the stockpiles filled up when people used them. Can you, uh, you have some uh, demos here of, of data that your drones have collected and people have overlaid on like go uh, uh, Google Maps? Right, so we've worked with Google Maps to overlay their, um, I have an example here where you actually, you can see data that's being overlaid on top of Google Earth. And, and what kind of data are we seeing? This is top-down ortho imagery. So basically, we, we fly the drone autonomously, we gather a lot of images, we stitch it all together using GPS data, and then we overlay on top of the uh, Google Earth. This way, our clients can actually use something that's familiar to them, which is you know, Google, and they can basically browse through the properties, they can, do, they can look at uh, three months ago, they can look at a day ago, and um, what we offer on our platform is the ability to see changes. We can actually give you um, a history of all, all the big changes that happened throughout a month. Now, uh, we just visited Velodyne, which makes the uh, uh, spinning thing on top of a self-driving car, the uh, LiDAR. And they have a smaller one, and they said they're, 
several of their customers are flying this LiDAR uh, to gather data. Do you need something that sophisticated to do this kind of work? We actually don't. We early days were working really hard to figure out how to create 3D models. And um, what we learn is we partner up with Autodesk and they have software that only uses imagery and GPS data to actually create 3D models and they're pretty accurate. Can you show us another one? Maybe uh, some other examples, I don't know. Here's an example of a 3D model created just purely with images. And what are we seeing here? So this is uh, the TI hangar. Okay. Treasure Island. And so I could fly this over a building, fly it around the building, and get enough, just with a regular 2D camera. Just a regular 2D camera. And then Autodesk can turn it into a 3D model. And yeah. you said it's accurate to within two centimeters? Yes, yeah, it's very accurate, yeah, to within two centimeters. Wow. Yeah. And so now I have a, a building a model and I can do all sorts of fun stuff. With Autodesk, you can actually import it into their Autodesk tool set and you can do work with it. So um, how real is this business? Because uh, you know, drones are new, uh, imagery is new. You know, uh, is there really that big a market out there for this? Yeah, I think we, we took a whole different approach at this market. We're not too fixated with drones we're fixated with the data, right? So what I tell people is that in the world of, um, you know, ground stations and ground robots and UAVs everywhere, we're the ones who use the drones to collect data. Um, another example is, um, and it, you know, imagine if there's no bicycles, right? So we invented a bicycle to allow for someone to get on a bicycle and collect data real fast for us. So through that process, we invented something that didn't exist, which is the ground robot. But our, our, our goal is to collect data and make it very easy for businesses to operate. But that's, that's you know, through that process, we, we, we had to build drones. Yeah. And just like we want to collect data for all of the world to allow access for people to be able to catch poachers, you know, or to a crowd control or to count cars and parking lots for analysis of your, you know, ad campaigns or traffic reporting. We want to be able to collect all of the data on an ongoing basis using uh, a whole different uh, level of technology. You, you actually have some of uh, a strip mine using it as well, right? Let's see that. Uh, which one? I'm the sorry. Strip, the strip mine with the cracks in oh, the Oh yeah, earth. This, this, one, this one is actually an interesting one because this is a fall that happened at one of our clients. Yeah. And this is actually uh, a very known issue at open pit mines that cost millions of dollars to repair. And what we're doing is we're giving them a, the ability to inspect this, these cracks that happen on all those open pit mines without the use of putting people in danger of having to walk th through all of that. So yeah. we send the UAVs and do top down on an ongoing basis and we use computer vision to detect to see if there's any cracks on them. Very interesting. Um, what is the the legal climate with dr drones, we keep hearing, uh, like Coachella, when I went there, said no drones, and Yosemite said yeah. no drones, and uh, the FAA now is uh, uh, chasing after people who flew it in New York and saying, oh, there's, there's lots of new laws that are going to probably come, up, come out to control where these c things can be flown. Yeah, I mean, is that going to affect you? Or? We have a lot of connections at the FAA, at least five or ten, to five or ten, uh, and a lot of it because the, all of them, they go to a lot of these industry events. And the general message is, you know, the FAA is really trying to prevent, it's trying to keep people safe, right? It's not trying to prevent people from making money, right? So the, the ultimate goal is that if all of a sudden everyone is able to make money using drones by selling the data, then you have a gold rush. And you don't want a gold rush where everyone is flying these things without any experience. I would be afraid to have my kid fly and, you know, walking around with these things flying around. So I am, we're, in the, we're, we're on the side of the FAA when it comes to let's put a framework for safety first. So when we talk to them about the things that we're doing, they're not too concerned when, when these things are being flown by people who own the UAV in their own private property and they're not selling the data. They're using it for their own use to keep people safe. So that ke that, that's a whole different um, utility that they're, they're not really interested in. Yeah. Um, where, where else do I want to go with these? Because it's a really interesting new business. Let, let's say I have, uh, well, Rocky's dad was a, uh, is a construction guy. He built a lot of bu big buildings. And let's say I wanted to 
uh, buy one of your drones or, or rent it? How do I uh, how do I deal with you? <laughs> yeah. Do I call you up and say, hey, can I have one of your drones fly up and, and uh, get get data every day? Well, so if I it's can... you, yes. But <laughs> um, you know, the process we we have. If you go to our site, yeah. you basically contact us, and we have a partnership program where people apply for. But right now, last year, we ran a, pr a partnership program where we have top companies apply. We have Clayco, uh, we have First Solar. We have some of the best top companies in the world working with us. And all they all came to us, you know, and some of them we met through industry events. And um, the process is basically we look at companies um, and see the potential of growth. For instance, one of our clients have 5,000 job sites everywhere, all around the world. So we see, okay, we can grow them in one place and we can easily expand across all of their job sites, at least 50%, and that creates huge opportunity for us. So we're only working with companies that, um, one, we're learning from, um, they're teaching us how to build our interfaces, and that can truly benefit from our product on a daily basis, and then has opportunity to scale. So if I if I had a big construction project that I wanted, uh, how, how much uh, does this cost? Where, so how do, right now, how do the, I hire you? yeah. So right now the cost is you you basically go through the process of signing an LOI, a letter of interest, and um, you purchase or lease the drone. So if you lease the drone, the ground robot, you get the drone for free for a given period of you leasing it. So if you lease it for six months, you get the UAV for free, and uh, it's yours and you operate it. Um, if you just want to outright purchase it, it's 100K. And we that's have- for the, That's for the ground station. The ground robot. Yeah, right. as well as the drone. The as drones well as are, I mean, you can buy a drone like this for 1300, something like that. Right, but it, this one is more. equipped specifically to fly with the um, ground station. Yeah. Also, we've written a lot of software to keep uh, the drone really safe. So every, every time it takes off, we run software to check to see if the battery is healthy. Um, if it has enough battery to go, if any of the sensors are utilizing more battery than the others. So we're, we've written a lot of software just to keep things safe. Yeah. Talk to me about that, because there's a whole lot of innovation going on in drones. You're, you're using drone as a data collection platform to make a data business, right? Yeah. So you're not, so you're not like one of these uh, crazy drone freaks, are you? Not at all. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I'm not a drone Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but you did write some software, to, like you said, check it and make sure it. it we love automating these guys. Yeah. Like we love making them completely autonomous without the need of human intervention. Yes, so we write a lot of software to make them completely autonomous. So some of the software we've written, um, we highly optimize these drones. A lot of the drone software or systems out there, they're so poorly optimized when it comes to payload, like a lot of the discharge rate that, are, that, get, that gets sent out to the motors are not really accurate in terms of how much you need to send off to actually spin the motor. So there's a lot of inefficiency. That's why our drones fly for up to 35 minutes, because we, we tune every single thing, including the, how, much, uh, how much electricity we send off to the speed controllers. So a lot of that very specific and very, um, uh, uh, very low level uh, programming and software is, hasn't been written before. We've been writing all of it. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, that, it's just uh, a crazy new electric platform, right? Yes. Um, what, what if there's a huge windstorm come in? Because you're, you're designing these for farmers or for yes. construction projects, and they're just going to sit there. The, every half an hour, the drone's going to go up, take a, a picture or something, and come That's down. That's correct. Right. What happens if there's a huge uh, monsoon that comes in or something? <laughs> so these robots are uh, built so that they can withstand 40 miles per hour winds. Um, anything higher, the basically the ground station grounds the robot. It doesn't. It can go up if it if it feels that there's too much water outside or if the wind is too high. Um, it has it has built in. It has um, something that checks to see how much battery power is using. If it's using over a certain percentage, it's most likely because it's trying to fly within a very windy area, and it's, it, it basically goes back to the ground station. We also have self-check mechanisms so that if it can't land, it goes find a safe spot to land and just wait for someone to go and put it back into the ground station. So we're, we're basically adding all of these like edge cases into the system. If I'm a farmer and I want to watch, uh, you know, 
let's say, a thousand acres, can I pre-program the drone to fly in a pattern to capture that data and then fly back? That's correct. So you basically go through our interface and we, you create what we call a data capture plan. And you say, this is my area of interest. Do it every two hours or every week. Send me an email and then run this software on top of it. So we pre-create different types of software depending on the market. So for um, if you're doing construction, typically they run the pattern check software. So if you're running a specific check on an ongoing basis, we'll tell you within a week where, when the biggest changes happen. So we'll, we'll highlight Thursday, and then you can drive it, dive into it and see that a crane move. For agriculture, we do a lot of NDVI. So you can apply the NDVI um, filter, and we give you What's data. That? NDVI, well, it's basically give you the um, check the leaves and see if there's a, is a need to water the... Uh, so you're probably using a red filter or something to look at A, a multi-spectrum camera. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So, so basically it. it detects vegetation. So you're going to have different kinds of devices hung underneath this, not just a GoPro. No, there's so... different kinds of sensors. Or, uh, tell me about the sensors. Right. So the, I, so the first sensor we're using, a very straight up camera, uh, we're using a GoPro camera. Yeah, like, like this one. That, like that one. And it's modified so that it has our own board on it so that you can trigger the shutter. Um, eventually, so we have our series of um, the ground robot you saw the first time was the uh, Evolution 2. Yeah. At some point, we're going to release Ev uh, Discovery 3, which is basically one that's going to swap out the uh, sensor as well. So if you're a landowner, you're not really going to worry about which sensor you're going to use, yeah. you're going to worry about whether you want to detect heat or you want to detect vegetation, and we'll swap out the right uh, sensor for you. You don't have to really even worry about the UAV. That's cool. Um, what was the most challenging software to write on this thing? The landing. The landing was probably the most difficult. Um, the ground station, obviously, the swapping of the battery, you can see it as a, as a, as a vending machine, right? So a lot of it is... Um, it's a lot of work, but it's not as complicated as landing something that's in the air and making it so that it... So what, do you have a Death Star tractor beam that pulls that <laughs> thing down? Or so how, how do you land, a, how do you make sure that you land consistently in, in the same spot? In a very simple way, um, we have a lot of proprietary technology that uses radio. So it's basically a directional microwave beam and little radio receivers. So it gets locked in. And if it moves a little bit, we know immediately if it moved to the left, to the right, and we basically center it real fast. It's extremely accurate. It's the same technology that is used for landing the so uh, space shuttle. A, you do have a tractor beam. <laughs> I do, we do, actually. <laughs> we do. It's not quite the same as, yeah. a, as on the uh, Star Trek, Star Wars movie. Exactly. But, uh, but it sounds pretty, pretty... So you had to write a lot of sensor code to see sensor patterns? Yeah, exactly. So we have a microwave beam that goes up, and then we have receivers on each arm. And as, as it goes in, it gets locked in. And if it moves a little bit, we tell it, don't move this way. You just keep, it keeps locking in until it goes all the way down. Very cool. Yeah. Where do you think this world is going uh, of drones? Am I, we're seeing all sorts of little drones, big drones, heavy lifters that can grab a red camera, right? My friend Chase Jarvis uses those to yeah. shoot skiing vis videos. I think, you know, if, you, if we take a step away from what we're doing, I think you're going to see the biggest thing is just, uh, you know, delivery. You're going to see this big, wing, this big fixed wing, um, you know, aircraft being able to completely automate the uh, delivery of packages. And I'm not talking about these tiny little drones. But I'm talking about big fixed wing drones being completely autonomous, flying in areas that are not public and being able to uh, land very safely and then just go on an ongoing basis. Imagine, imagine having a network that can programmatically um, be redirected based so on Amazon, demand. So Amazon wasn't that off base when they were saying they're playing with this for, for delivery? Because I always thought that was a PR stunt, right? Well, you know, what they're doing is they're focusing on last mile and it makes sense to use a quadcopter, but they're just very far from making that a reality. I mean, they know that too. Safety-wise, you can't have props flying everywhere. Uh, that you need to make sure that they're not falling from the skies. So when you and there's it, a noise system. Uh, they're noisy. Yeah, nuisance you don't. Issue. It's, it's definitely you know for us it's easy because we fly inside construction. Everyone's wearing hard hats. Uh, they already have insurance for things that fall off the sky. Um, same with same with mines. But when it comes to the public, right? You can't really. It's it's going to be very tricky to have these guys flying around delivering things. 
the way we see it, um, I started this thing called Air Highway uh, a long time ago, before Skycatch. It was basically a bunch of lawyers and activists and engineers thinking about if we're going to have an air highway at some point, let's us propose a blueprint for an air highway. So we came up with a, an idea of how, what's the safest way to allow for this sort of technology to be integrated into our into our day to day life. Um, you know, we had drop off stations, charging stations, using railroad tracks for actually flying and go, going from city to city, so it's really safe. So you know, there's definitely, yeah, I th I, there's definitely going to be, um, you know, package delivery. There's going to be, be, you know. Air, big fixed wing carrying bigger cargo uh, completely autonomously. Uh, you'll be able to, if you do last mile, you'll be able to actually d redirect your robots so that they concentrate on heavy areas, uh, which you can't do today. Um, and that's why FedEx is able, is, is basically have to send everything in one place before they send it off to to, to um, other places because you don't, you can't programmatically, you know, tell the, the the planes to reprogram itself and go to another location where there's more heavy. Um, demand for packaging, right? So those things are going to be solved um, eventually. But I think it's going to be more ambitious and more interesting when it comes to the fixed wing, big fixed wings. When once the FA opens up the uh, the uh, the airways, wow. is there a, uh, any investor interest in this space yet? A lot of it. I think a lot of you know a lot of the early interest have have been investors that invest in our company. Uh, we're really focused on the data too. So every single investor that invests in Skycatch, they invest it because they see the vision uh, being all about the data, for us at least. Um, and, um, but there's still a lot of, a lot of opportun opportunities for other things to do with, with UAVs. And I think that the investor community, um, I think is just learning. Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of investors, they come to us just to learn what, what is this all about. And I think that we're go still going through that process. A lot of them are just watching to see who's gonna be successful. Uh, before they start investing more. Are you trying to push a, a, a battery standard so that um, y you could have these base stations all over the place that are gonna grab a drone and then uh, change its battery out? So yeah, so we, we also have IP on the, the battery itself because the battery actually is a cartridge that has storage as well. So aside from swapping out the battery power, we swap out 30 gigs of data. So that allows us to retrieve a ton of data and do these like really sophisticated top-down imagery and then be able to take off immediately. Then the ground station basically does the job of creating those stitching jobs and then the drone is off, you know, collecting more data. And so, so we can basically be up and running in within 20 seconds. That's awesome. Uh, where do we uh, learn more about this? Uh, you can go to skycatch.com. Very cool. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks and, for uh, having me. Hope to have you in Paris in uh, December at, at the web for this uh, session on drones because this is going to be a lot of fun. Sounds great. And a uh, really interesting business. Thanks.